Well, the Patreon viewers have decided, and between a list of choices that included a sci-fi original movie and a porno spoof, the clear winner of this week's episode is a goddamn 80s romantic melodrama? What the fuck? That's like doing a viewer's choice on bad Chicago movies and having Blues Brothers 2000 and Poltergeist 3 beaten out by Windy City. And what is with forgotten 80s romance movies having a poster color scheme that makes them look post-apocalyptic? Look, I thought the porno spoof was gonna win too. Or maybe I just hoped it would, since that would take far less time and get far more hits, but ID83 was ahead by so much that I ended up calling it 12 hours before voting ended, which made the disaster bros very unhappy. So basically, Patreon subscribers paid their hard-earned money to be bored! A common theme in the thread seemed to be that people thought ID83 was going to be along the lines of moment by moment or endless love. Have we gotten so cynical that the suggestion of any romance means it's going to be an unholy disaster of moment by moment proportions? You could have just asked me. The answer is no. Or you could have just watched the trailer. Follow your dreams and do. Independence Day. What you love to do. Growing up in a small town is no problem. Then why am I watching a movie about it? Kathleen Quinlan stars as Mary Ann Taylor, a small town waitress with big dreams of becoming a photographer. Then she meets the rugged Jack Parker. Weird how the movie is about a photographer, but the first 30 seconds are a black screen. So did they leave the lens cap on? Ugh, blatant product placement for Nikon camera. And she's lucky she's not a gross neck beard, or doing something like this would get her arrested immediately. From this angle here, it feels like she's eight feet tall. The opening isn't nearly as jolly as the opening of Cover Up. <laughs> I don't think there's going to be any spies in this film. And why does the water tower have a dick? David Keith plays Jack, who has just returned to town, and his meet-cute with Mary Ann involves her being an idiot. Mary Ann Taylor. You son of a bitch! I'm sure they have a lot to catch up on. What is it you call that? C'est un chapeau, un top. Parker, it's a hat. Never used to wear stuff like that before. You don't get to judge people for having stupid looking hats. He gives her a lift to work, and David Keith is doing very well at playing romance movie stuntman Mike. Marianne works at the local diner, and Jack is only interested in her because of the time portal in the back room. Must be a restaurant that only serves dying old ladies. Not sure why this scene is sandwiched between her getting dropped off and her working. This place is fantastic when you're hungover at 3 a.m. The most unrealistic thing about the movie is that there's not a single person here named Flo. But oddly enough, the script was written by someone named Alice. As you can see, Mary Ann is taking care of her dying mother. Mama, what are you doing out here? Honey, I just wanted to get some air. I'm not dead yet. <laughs> Spoiler alert! And she's trying to get into a California university to study photography. You used to say any school that didn't take you was crazy. That's any school around here. It's different in California. They got standards. Well, that was before reality television and kale. I can picture you in Los Angeles. You'll be going all over with that camera of yours. Ah, uh, yes, she's going to be the most beloved Californian. The paparazzi! But if you have big dreams, just close your eyes and think about it for a while. <laughs> At some point, they started thinking about Burt Reynolds' naked photo shoot. Jack returns to visit his family, which includes his sister Nancy, played by Diane Wiest, and his father, who doesn't much get along with Jack. Les, honey, dinner's ready. Okay, look, I gotta go. Face it. You're a loser. 
Dad doesn't need much setup or even any context to call his son a loser. Dad much prefers his son-in-law, Les, played by Cliff DeYoung, but only because he hasn't seen him bitching in the kitchen or crying in the bedroom all night. Les is abusive to his wife. Not that Dad is much better. Whee! Yeah! Dad, yeah, please stop it. Don't you tell your father what to do. Please! Smell like a tree! Smell like a tree! Yeah! He loves it! Okay, slow down, Oliver Reed, from Burnt Offerings. Only way this could be more awkward is if Dad admitted to taking pictures of kids in trucks. Hopefully, this next scene will be more pleasant. After she cut up his body, she stuffed him into jars. Mason jars. What? Well, now it seems more like something I'd review. Damn, Kathleen is chain-smoking in this film. She gives Jack his headshots for his Biff Tannen auditions, and then asks him out. You better pick me up at my house tonight, Jack Parker. You may never get another chance like this again. That's just plain not true. He works with the sexy Richard Farnsworth. Somehow I think their date is going to include a dish of something deep fried. Well, what are you doing out there, Jack Parker? I don't have time to wait for any man. I don't care who he is. Ooh, this night's gonna end with a ball gag and a cattle prod. Marianne may have invented the concept of the man bun, but she did not perfect it. Random thought, you know what this movie needs? Wingshauser, or Sandra Locke, or Deborah Winger. Something about all of that makes sense. So, what's this date gonna be like? <laughs> Slow down. You're giving the chemistry between Carmen and Terry Copley from Riot a run for its money. And that's including when they do talk. You know, some people might say that a girl who comes here alone is cheap, but honestly, new, I think anybody who says that ought to be shot straight through the heart. Not every first date in the South has a conversation about concealed carry. That's a second date topic. Uh-oh, is that Les cheating on his wife? It could be his twin, Farley Flavors. Honest mistake. So Jack takes Mary Ann to the point. It's less sex and more watching car races. So this is what you like to do. Yeah, he masturbates when they wreck. Southern Crash doesn't feel as sleazy. What's this? He's getting in on the racing action now? I said he, not she. Uh, no, I meant you could watch him over there. You know, with the rest of the tits. Oh, over there. Oh, lovely. Gee, what are they talking about over there? Mascara? Oh, no. No, they're comparing hairstyles. Joke's on you. They're actually talking about muffin recipes. Don't you feel stupid? This area feels like it smells of Coors Light and weak old prime rib. Oh, this is so intense. Alive and Well Race 2000 doesn't quite have the same ring to it. This date is gonna end swell. Mm, yes, a handshake. Much like closing a business deal. Neither situation is gonna end in sex. So, Jack tries again. Might as well. She still thinks he's Kurt Russell. She shows him her portfolio, and he gets way more interested when it gets to the pictures from the Cordo Maltese. I, for one, am too distracted by the awkward cuts they're inserting, as opposed to using pan and scan. Not that it matters. I am still gonna scold this movie for not being in widescreen. The two sneak into Travis Bickle's apartment, the perfect place for more awkward conversation. Look, I don't care who you've been with before. From now on, you're gonna be with me. That may seem creepy, but when you compare him to Clay Walsh, he'll at least be in the same room with her. He won't make her practice cutting up baby food on their first date, and he's probably respectful to strippers. Plus, he actually kisses her and does what he wanted to do at the end of Officer and a Gentleman. Cue the love montage. He must be in love with his car, since it's showing that more than it is Mary Ann. And what are you looking at? Because it's not the camera. Unfortunately, the school she's applying to is only accepting 25 out of 700 candidates. 
This movie is just like Flashdance, only replace Laura Branigan with more spousal abuse. Jack, what a nice surprise! Nancy! Hi. Why do you keep opening the goddamn door? Because someone knocked, you jackass! Jack wants to borrow money from Les because of the big race coming up. Everybody I know wants to borrow money from me. What gave everybody this idea that I had all this dough? That's a fair question, considering Les looks like a dipstick. Although he just happens to have that kind of cash on him, like an asshole. You just love to be here all alone with me out of town, wouldn't you? <laughs> no. No. <laughs> yeah, sure, you bring some stranger back here the first night I'm gone. <laughs> <laughs> She's gonna light you on fire, especially when he starts throwing matches at her. Hey, what are you doing? No, oh, this is just a little game we play. She likes it. Oh, yeah? Well, I don't like it. <laughs> How am I supposed to react to this? This is more awkward than Lloyd watching his old racist cartoons. He should really be more offended by that. Just like Jack should be a little more offended that some twerp is throwing matches at his sister. Kick his ass! This display is really ruining Jack's day of watching Mary Ann sleep. You think many women get beat up? He's asking whether spousal abuse exists! It can't be. No woman's gonna put up with getting beat. She wouldn't stay with a man like that. She'd just get up and walk out the door. You sound like you'd have a very winning Twitter account. It's very pro-Cosby and anti-progress. God damn, I want Nancy's story to turn into a revenge film. You know, I wish Les wasn't coming home tonight. It's, it's kind of like it was before you got married. Ugh. Next, is Jack going to ask whether incest is a thing? I have a feeling we're soon gonna find out why Helen Buckman is Sans' husband in Parenthood. I guess I could've asked her nephew, but he tried to fucking kill me! David Keith is instantly woken up by a phone call telling him that he lost another role to Keith David. Actually, it's that his sister tried committing suicide. Could it have to do with her abusive husband? Oh, 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 Jack, let go of him. Hey, listen to me. If you hurt her, I'll break your fucking neck. Don't just come right out and tell him that. Get on his good side and then strangle him the Corleone way. Nancy is staying in the mental ward, and it gets really weird when the other patients keep watching slasher films and insist that they're true stories. What a time to be alive. I'm pregnant. Well, that's great. Isn't it? Yeah, it's great. That's why she tried killing herself. I joke, but this is actually really depressing. I don't want to go home. I don't want to go home. I don't want to go okay. home. <laughs> Good choice, Internet! And as Jack leaves, now they have the opportunity to dream about naked Burt Reynolds as the camera backs away. It's 53 minutes in, and now I know why it's called Independence Day, though I've never seen someone combine their love for the 4th of July with their diaper fetish. Come on, sweetie, didn't you always want brush scratches on your heels? And take off that stupid hat, John Deere. Independence Day is also Acid Day in the South. It's also the day in which couples pose for movie box covers. Better than the poster, which makes it look like it's taking place in Jesus times. Ah, oh, good. A double date with danger. Maybe Les will be nicer to his wife. Doesn't she look great? Great. I do not. You do? I'm telling you, ever since you got back from the hospital, you look just like a movie star. Yeah, you look just like that lady from Bullets Over Broadway. I see Jack and Les's first date also ends in a handshake. Oddly enough, it's not Les that makes things uncomfortable. I mean, uh, are you gonna make it legal and get married, or what? Yeah. No. 
<laughs> rejected. Someone should liven the mood by shooting another person. Or acting like you're gonna snap at a moment's notice. I thought you'd be sort of crazy. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> but you're not. Not one bit. <laughs> oh, yes, I am. You just can't see it. I hide it. Well, you're not hiding it very well. That's a face that says Les is gonna end up a eunuch by the end of the movie. Marianne claims she stopped thinking about L.A., and so is the movie. The Nancy subplot takes way more precedence over the main plot. Maybe now she'll get back into her photog- oh, never mind. Mom's collapsed. Don't worry, she's fine. Ah, the good old days. Back when there was more smoking in hospitals than insured patients. This may be sad, but look, Kathleen Quinlan in a bra, that'll put a smile on your face. You take that hard-boiled attitude and you turn it sunny side up, little missy. But there is good news. She got into the university and she's even gotten a scholarship. Says the man in charge who claims that she has the best photographs he's ever seen. <laughs> okay. Mr. Malone, excuse me. This was real nice of you, but I'm not going. But the bad news is, she's an idiot. Only one thing will change her mind, the sight of David Keith's ass. She's afraid to leave town because she had a premonition of what happens to her in the movie Breakdown. But she decides to accept the scholarship. Step one, dress more like Nastasia Kinski from the movie Exposed. She looks like someone who uses the words gauche and apropos, even though she doesn't know what either means. Mmm, smoking in the hospital, drinking while pregnant. How did I survive this decade? Oh, great. Brad Major Shithead is home. I don't see any dinner here. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I know you're waiting for another shock treatment reference, but the movie already did that for me earlier. Do you have shock therapy? So instead, I just really want someone to shoot him. Preferably before he beats the shit out of his pregnant wife, which Marianne immediately tells Jack about. I just over at Nancy's house! He's beating her off right now! I nope, not my fucking problem! Just kidding. And why does this movie keep reminding me that I should be watching The Godfather? This is for 2012 Doomsday and Carnosaur 2 and The Skateboard Kid! This scene is actually part of the Little Scene sequel, Every Which Way But Wife Beating. And where are their kids during this whole movie? Are they on an extended Independence Day vacation? Is that a thing? Les wants revenge. By the way, bro, I guarantee Jax is bigger. Oh wait, this is almost exactly like the abuse subplot in The Godfather. After he gets the shit kicked out of him, he asks her to call her brother, thus setting him up for... I don't know, getting shot at a toll booth? Never mind. It's like the godfather of Talia Shire blew up both her and her husband. Now how is he supposed to take over the entire human race? <laughs> Cliff de Young was in shock treatment. And I'm pretty sure no one is attending Les's funeral. I'm sorry about Nancy. It took you till the funeral to say that? You were there when he found out! And what does Jack and Nancy's dad think of all of this? He seemed to be the only one who liked Les. Also, it's a little insensitive of you to be smoking at this funeral. Marianne wants Jack to go to L.A. with her for good reason. This place sucks. And by the time my mama dies, I'm going to be sitting in Los Angeles. I'll be sitting in the sun. Please leave Mercury with me. I don't know, though. If you want to stay close to the sun, you should probably stay on Mercury. So, Jack decides to go to L.A. or not. I'm not going to Los Angeles. I'm staying here. I don't care either way. Probably because he's not very likable. Maybe you led me on. Maybe I thought you were going to stay. You made it sound so damn hard to get into that school of yours. Oh, sure. Look, honey, all I'm saying is I had absolutely no faith in you succeeding. And yes, this is the type of movie to feature someone storming out of the room. Go. You're so hot to go to Los Angeles, right there's the goddamn door. Go. Hardly. 
It keeps going. Oh, and Mom might be dead. Not sure. Best leave before finding out. Can't have another death in the last ten minutes. She does have a dad, too, but her smokes have more of an appearance in the movie than her father. While Marianne does leave for L.A., Jack decides that he doesn't want to live his life in a Ross Hagen movie, so he decides to take his car to L.A. where he can crash into more things, unless he's going on a honeymoon with his one true love, his trophy, and where he works as a mail-order Conway Twitty. The film has a happy ending, I guess, with the two ending up together. It ends on a shot of a dirty pool for some reason, foreshadowing that she's moved to L.A. to murder Joe Gillis. I don't know. I still don't even know why this movie is called Independence Day, since the holiday itself is only in five minutes of the film, and it certainly didn't end with her gaining her independence. Unless it's talking about Diane Weiss' independence from her abusive husband and life. So, was that worth it? I hope so, because it's made the rest of my day fucking depressing. Independence Day seems like the type of romance film that was made off the heels of Urban Cowboy or An Officer and a Gentleman, only with slightly more mayo. No, not Zack Mayo, just mayo in general. The fact that this movie has never received any kind of DVD release shows that even the movie studio has forgotten about its existence. Oh, never mind. It's on the Warner Archive collection. Whatever. It may be in widescreen, but I highly doubt it has a commentary by Les's Matches. If I wanted to see a movie about big city dreams and domestic violence, I'll stick with... with... Lloyd, Lloyd, can you turn that down? I'm trying to make a stupid movie comparison here. <laughs> Whatever. I don't know what movie I'd rather stick with. I'm too busy thinking about how I'd rather blow myself up. The Independence Day porno spoof may not have been the one chosen, but I sure as hell feel like I just got fucked. Angina. Shit. 